This week on Waterways. White-crowned pigeons. Illegal dumping in East Everglades. And the Youth Conservation Corps. Florida Keys in South Florida are home to many unique and captivating creatures. As research has proven, each of these species is linked and interdependent, composing the fabric of Mother Nature. This is the story of the white-crowned pigeon. A large pigeon with distinctive white crown and slate gray back, the white-crowned pigeon can fly at incredible speeds. Able to outmaneuver most hawks, the white-crowned pigeon easily passes boats traveling 40 knots. The white-crowned makes his nest in the uninhabited red and black mangrove islands off the mainline keys. Surrounded by water, the nests on these islands are safe from land predators like raccoons, which can devastate a colony very quickly. However, there is no food for the pigeons on these islands. They don't eat out here at all. There's no food for them to eat. They have to go to the mainline Keys. So uh, Key West is, uh, is a big part of uh, this bird's future in the United States. Uh, it's not the only place that they, they nest, but most of these birds we've uh, uh, been following, we know from uh, radio collaring uh, birds this year that uh, most of them go to, to up specific places in Key West. White-crowned pigeons need two distinct habitats for survival, islands and forest-supporting fruiting trees. The mainline keys have many varieties of fruiting trees, but their numbers have been dropping rapidly. Their favorite, poisonwood, causes severe irritation and skin rashes on many people, and as a result, this species is typically removed from yards. The destruction of hardwood hammocks due to human expansion poses a major threat to the white-crowned pigeon. For three years, Tom and a handful of volunteers have counted white-crowned pigeons at their nesting areas, from Bahia Honda Key all the way south to the lakes west of Key West. Key West, uh, Key West has a lot to offer this species. They're really banking on what happens at Key West. There's no hammocks. When you leave Key West, the town, where's the next big hammock you encounter? They depend on hardwood hammocks to feed. That's where the fruit trees are, the poison woods, the blollies, those kinds of things. There really isn't much between Key West and, and Saddle Bunch Key at all. Key West is crucial to the white-crowned pigeon. They cannot fly to Big Pine. It's too far. And there is nothing in the Great White Heron Refuge for them to feed on. Therefore, white-crowned pigeons have resorted to eating bird seed. Although it was believed until recently that the white-crowned pigeon is an obligate frugivore, Tom and others have reported white crowns foraging in backyard bird feeders. In Key West, there's, there's not, there's very little of the native hardwoods left. Um, there's a few spots here and there that the pigeons will feed on, but we've found that they're um, also feeding at bird feeders now, feeding on bird seed, which we don't think they had done before. There is no record of them doing that before. For two weeks, Jeff Kingscott has been tracking the elusive white crown pigeon, studying an area between Big Pine, south to Key West. Jeff and his crew follow radio signals coming from tagged pigeons in order to observe their behavior. Uh, right now we're um, following one of the white crown pigeons. We have a transmitter on. Um, I just picked up a signal to the east. It was a pretty weak signal. So we're going to try to drive and get a little closer to where this bird is and uh, see if we can find it, see if we can get a visual on it and find out uh, what kind of tree specifically it is sitting in or what kind of habitat it's using. Um, see if it's just sitting there or if it's feeding. 
By tracking the birds, they can determine behaviors and flight patterns. Most importantly, when a bird is spotted, Jeff can determine what the bird is eating and which trees the white crown pigeons depend upon for survival. The four most common fruits in their diet are poison wood, blolly, shortleaf fig, and strangler fig. While each of these species has been losing the battle against industrial and residential development, the poison wood has been hardest hit. The poison wood tree is essential to the white crowns because it has more energy per gram than figs and is richer in lipids. While white crowns may depend upon these hardwood hammock species for their survival, some of these species depend upon the survival of the white crown pigeons. When the white crowns eat the fruit from hardwood hammock trees such as the poison wood, the seeds are then spread across the land. If the keys lose its hardwood hammocks, it means less food for white crown pigeons, which means fewer birds to distribute hardwood hammock seeds, which means it is harder for hardwood hammocks to recolonize. These babies get fed milk for the first three to four days. The mother regurgit and the father regurgitate food right into the baby's mouth. It's, it's liquid. Now, they can do that easy with fruits, but can they do it with grains efficiently? We don't really know. But they're banking on a lot of these bird feeders at Key West as well as Old Town, and, and there may be some problems associated with that. We don't know if grain is good or bad for these birds yet. We're, we're learning, um, but it's certainly a switch. Most people weren't aware at all that these birds ate grain, period. It wasn't in the literature until just recently, and that was pretty much a, a function of people in Key West informing us about that. But what I would say is if you have a bird feeder, keep it sanitary. There's a lot of diseases that can be spread. If you have water there, change it uh, at least every other day. Uh, you don't want these white crown pigeons who haven't been exposed perhaps to some of these diseases that some of these more common birds that come through the Keys uh, have been exposed to, it, it could put them down. Recently, white crown pigeons have been forced to change their diet. Rapid loss of native fruiting trees has cut the bird's food source drastically. What effects the change has upon the health of these pigeons is uncertain. However, since they are indeed eating in backyard feeders, it is essential that people keep their bird feeder clean and disinfected. White crowns are relatively new to the bird feeder habitat, thus diseases may exist to which the birds lack immunity. This bird is, uh, on a scale of one to 10, it's a 10. Uh, it's the Ferrari of the bird world in terms of uh, flight. All these islands are the future of this bird in terms of its nesting, but the refuge can't do squat about where they feed at, and that's out of our hands. Down here in Key West, there's no refuge areas that are available to them. So it's an interesting situation with a protected nesting area and a feeding area that's not protected. So I would urge when, if, if we get storm damage here or um, trees die, that we think about this species in particular when we replant or uh, when we put in a new tree. Um, we're really lucky to have this bird here. Um, it's really a neat, neat species. With so-called ecotourism on the rise in the Bahamas, the Caribbean, and Cuba, where hunters can shoot 40 birds per day, it has become even more important that the Florida Keys sustain the local population. While conservation agencies have worked wonders protecting white crown nesting habitats, it is much harder for them to protect the places that these birds feed. Therefore, individual homeowners of the Florida Keys may determine the fate of the white crowned pigeon. If residents of the Keys plant native fruiting trees, the white crowned pigeons will continue to have a food source and a future. Most days in Everglades National Park, you can look for miles and not see anything but wild grasses, pastel birds, 
and prehistoric lizards. Sometimes you must look very carefully to see signs of animal life. But if you're in the East Everglades where South Florida population sprawl has slammed up against the borders of the park, you'll see the most signs of life, human life, and human waste. It's hard to drive into this area onto the edge of the East Everglades here and not see piles of garbage, dumped vehicles or burned vehicles, stacks of tires, chemical spills, paint, contracting uh, supplies like um, roofing materials and debris like that. Uh, we get a lot of dumping that goes on out here. How is it that people can dump refuse illegally with no remorse, infusing waste into this once vibrantly healthy ecosystem? Greed? Laziness? Ignorance? Now, most of the time there's some kind of financial gain that they get from it. Um, the cars, a lot of times that those are stolen vehicles that they've used for a while. Um, sometimes it can be just people don't know any better. Um, they don't know that there's places throughout Dade County where they can take stuff like uh, yard debris, um, grass clippings and things like that, that you can go and dump those for free. We get a lot, a lot of people that come out and they dump um, refrigerators or washers and dryers and there, there are places that the county runs that you can dump those for free also. Trash and pollution generated by men and women has always been a problem for society. Through trial and grievous error, we have discovered the effects of pollution on the natural environment and thus have discovered techniques for mitigating and limiting these effects. However, trash that is illegally dumped is not processed or cleaned of toxins. You can see all the blue oil filters. Um, somebody's got a shop possibly illegal or they were doing some homework, they toss the oil filters from whatever they're changing into the bucket and then they bring it out here with their waste oil and they dump it into the ditch. And then all of this through here is all the oil as it's contaminated the soil. A vehicle that gets dumped out here has oil and gasoline inside of it and can have, um, can affect the water. Uh, even inert materials like construction debris that gets dumped out here, it will kill off certain vegetation and allow exotic species to come in. Illegal dumps kill native vegetation by blocking sunlight from toxic leaks and through suffocation. When these native species die, invasive exotic species that are hardier, like Brazilian peppers and Australian pines, move in and take over. We can have no exotics in an entire area and have a dump come in and if we don't get it cleaned up quick enough we'll have Brazilian pepper that'll start right on top of that pile and then we'll have exotics throughout that area. Where the Park Service could have finally been victorious after years of expelling invasives, they can now find themselves in battle once more. The ripple effect of a two meter square pile of garbage is alarming. That is why Ranger Mike Foster and the Everglades Park Law Enforcement Team arrest all those who dump illegally. Take them, take them, take them. They are dumping right now. This video, shot by Mike and his team, along with eyewitness reports and intense investigation, has enabled park authorities to successfully prosecute these criminals. Well, there's a wide range of penalties um, for people that dump illegally. Uh, under Florida state statute, there's just a small fine of a couple of hundred dollars all the way to it's a third degree felony if it's a large enough amount. Um, under federal statute, um, we've made Clean Water Act violations and sent people to jail for 18 months. There are proper places to bring garbage. We are not living in the dark ages. The people of South Florida live among more state and national parks than anywhere in the world. This means greater responsibility and greater accountability. Illegal dumpers are in the minority, but those who care are in the majority, and we're watching. If you're thinking about dumping illegally, out in the Everglades, uh, you run a high risk of getting caught and paying a significant fine that's going to be way more than the dumping fee would be. 
and if it's a big enough load, we're going to put you in jail for it. On most days in Everglades National Park, you can look for miles and not see anything but wild grasses, pastel birds, and prehistoric lizards. At Everglades National Park, kids are a familiar sight. Outreach programs abound for those young individuals who are not yet calloused by the troubles of our planet. These kids offer eternal hope and may even spawn new ideas in preserving our natural world. And these young adults are getting paid to do it. That's because they are part of Everglades National Park's Youth Conservation Corps, YCC. Youth Conservation Corps was started back in the uh, late 1960s and really blossomed in the early 70s and then, uh, and then its use sort of fell off uh, as parks had to absorb more and more of the cost of the program. For the first time in nearly 20 years, the Youth Conservation Corps program has returned to Everglades National Park. Thanks to the initiative of Deputy Superintendent John Benjamin, who has witnessed the success of YCC in numerous other national parks, these seven kids were now, temporarily, federal employees. It, it essentially takes kids who are between the ages of 15 and 21, I think, on the outside, and brings them into national parks, in this case, uh, national monuments, any national parks of this area, and uh, puts them to work doing good, high quality conservation work that furthers the mission of the National Park Service. For eight weeks, the YCC have dedicated themselves to the Hole in the Donut Project. Their mission, to help eliminate the park's exotic plants and replace them with native species. Before we had the uh, Youth Conservation Corps employees or enrollees here at the park, um, all the field work and all the planting had to be accomplished by my staff alone, uh, which at last year was one additional person besides me. And uh, this year I have three employees plus the uh, current seven Youth Conservation Corps enrollees. So I have ten people that are out working for me this summer as compared to one person last summer. So it has made a great difference in the amount of work that we've been able to accomplish this summer. There's no question that the backbreaking work that the YCC is doing is essential to the park's health. The presence of Brazilian peppers, also known as Florida holly, has grown to epidemic proportions. In the Everglades proper there are about a hundred thousand acres that are disturbed uh, with Brazilian pepper. Uh, the hole in the donut happens to be an area where it's really highly concentrated. Uh, about 7,000 acres of, of just a uh, one species thick forest. The Youth Conservation Corps enrollees uh, that we are employ, employing this summer um, are assisting the Hole in the Donut Wetland Mitigation and Restoration Project uh, by doing some experimental plantings for me. The Youth Conservation Corps has helped plant an assortment of native hardwood saplings along a tract of land that has been cleared of Brazilian pepper. In the process, the kids have learned about the Everglades ecology while developing teamwork and communication skills. I've learned that, like, what kind of plants are which ones and what kind of animals are out there and what kind of plants we're dealing with and how to treat them and stuff. It's a lot of experience. We, we learned a lot of stuff out here for the eight weeks that we've been out here. Right, hold it up. Right. Yeah, definitely. This has been a positive experience. We've got to work with a team, meet new people. It was a positive experience. Learned how to plant trees, learned about the Everglades. Got paid for it, too, so. Park staff often witness a shift in the kids' perspective. At first, the Corps is a summer job, a way to save up for their first car. 
Slowly, they become caretakers of this resource. Youth Conservation Corps program is truly one of the best examples of a win, 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 win situation. Everybody wins. And the, and the circle of people that wins is incredible. The park makes out because we get work done that it's, it, would be, it would be terribly expensive for us to do in other, uh, through other means, through contracts with, with graduate students or any other way that we are hiring full-time permanent staff. So we, we get benefit from it. We, the other, other benefits that we get out of it are that these young people are part of us. For that, for that they're part of this organization for that eight weeks. And that gives them a buy-in to their national parks because they aren't ours. They aren't just the, belong to the guys in the green and gray. It's, these are, are everybody's parks. This year, the kids enlisted for YCC were from Homestead. John and his staff hope to expand in future years to include teens from Key Largo and Everglades City. One thing about YCC and any other youth work program similar to that, it is one heck of a lot of work and it is never justified by just the work that we get out of it. We, we, put, we have to put a lot more effort into the program than is ever really paid for by the work that we get, although we do get some stuff done. The real benefit is, as I've said, it's in, in winning hearts and minds of that next generation that's coming up and that's going to take over responsibility for these natural and cultural treasures that we, we have in national parks. The excitement and wonder that small children feel for our national parks can recede as that child becomes an adult. As we become responsible for ourselves, it is easy to overlook the obligation we all have to the ecosystem that surrounds us. The Youth Conservation Corps is one more way to remind us that indeed our responsibilities extend beyond ourselves. <laughs>